Today I think we'll speak a little bit about, you know, my drug uh, habit, the way I used to deal drugs, you know what I mean, the way I used to be around drugs, how I got introduced to them, you know what I mean, what I started with, you know. I always hear a lot of people say they started with marijuana, you know. Uh, me, myself, I didn't have that luxury, you know. Uh, me and my little brother one time, were, uh, we were getting out of school, we were, we were real young, we were about maybe about 11 and 12, you know. We ran into some older dudes and they were right there and I remember we walked up, you know, I seen the first guy, he was holding on to the wall and he wasn't moving and I was like, hey, what did he smoke, you know? So the other dude says, hey, well, you know, I got it right here, you know what I mean? So he brought out this glass bottle, a pack of cool cigarettes and uh, what he did was he stuck the cigarette inside and he turned the cigarette on, he blew it backwards and he blew all the liquid into the cigarette and he told me this is a 20 dip right here, this is PCP. So I wanted to be curious to see what it did to you so we end up smoking it. Now we were 12 and 11 years old Remember me and my little brother smoked it, and I remember the feeling of uh, being like as strong as like strong as like ten guys. You know, it made me feel like I was strong, like for ten guys. You know, and uh, so we smoked it. You know what I mean? Uh, the next day, I went back to my little brother, and I told the dude, "Hey, man, let me buy ten dollars worth." You know, so he had a dippy one. He gave it to us. We went and smoked it, and uh, we didn't go home for two days. You know, right after that, I noticed once we smoked that PCP, you know, we were already getting interested in, in, in marijuana and weed. You know. We used to see my father deal with his drugs, but he was dealing with heroin. And I remember I used to hear them talk about it. Back then it was a quarter spoon, $25. And you would get high one time and you would be high all day until the nighttime, you know what I mean? And he only got down one time. Reason I know, cause I was with him, you know? So I used to watch my father, you know, deal with his little heroin, but he also sell weed on the side, you know what I mean? And we were really interested in the weed. Well, I had a friend down the street and his dad used to move a lot of weed, you know, he was one of the main weed connections. So, you know, I wanted to get, you know, I wanted to get into weed and see what it was about. So one day me and my friend were at his dad, were at his house, and I tell him, hey man, your dad's not here, why don't you go see if there's anything in his stash? So he goes in there, he comes out, and he brings out, I say about two ounces of weed, good weed, you know, and I tell him, man, that's a lot, your dad ain't gonna notice. He's like, no, I fixed it the same way and everything. So um, we had school the next day, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna take it to school. I'm gonna be cool, sell a few dimes, sell some joints, you know what I mean? And I thought I had it together. Went to school, took it in my backpack. We smoked one joint before we went, you know what I mean? And it was like the third time I had smoked weed, so we smoked the joint. I was already nervous going to school, but I went anyways. When I got there, you know, I kept smelling the fragrance of weed. While I was young, I didn't realize that the weed was coming out the back of my backpack, the smell. And I didn't realize that till we went to the bathroom. My little brother said, hey, you smell like weed, so. We opened it up, we ended up wrapping it with some paper towels, some more plastic, and we put it back in the backpack. And uh, they decided they wanted to go up to the field. So I was like, okay, let's go. So we went up to the field and we're up there. And I remember getting the weed, I put it on my lap, I get some rolling papers out. And mind you, I'm barely learning how to roll, but I'm about to roll a joint and I hear, hey. And I look up, man, it's the principal, man. We're in the seventh grade and the principal just caught me with an ounce of weed. He walks up, he grabs the weed. Where'd you get this at? You know what I mean? I said, I found it, you know? He's like, no, you didn't. Where'd you get it? Who sold it to you? So now he wants to call my parents and, you know, my mother, she wouldn't say nothing. My father, he's gonna get a little upset, but he already knows I'm doing something. He asked me like a couple weeks before while I was smoking weed, I denied it. But uh, now it's gonna come out the truth. And I'm really scared, man, because my father, he was, he was a nice guy, but when he got mad, he got really mad, you know what I mean? And I didn't know how mad he was gonna be that I got caught with weed, you know, but kind of surprised me when he came, you know, he came in, he talked to the principal, he came back out and he didn't tell me nothing. He didn't tell me nothing. On the way home, we get home and we stop, he parks the car and he tells me, uh, you know you're kicked out of school, right? I'm like, yeah, I got suspended, you know, what's the big deal? He says, no, you got kicked out of school. You got kicked out of the whole school district. And I was like, for weed? They caught me with weed? He said, no, well, you did a lot of things leading up to this. This was just the one that the icebreaker and now you're kicked out of school. So I was 12 years old and I was kicked out of the whole school district. I didn't know where to go to school. So I used to go in the afternoon too, about three houses down, I had one of my homies over there. And um, I know his dad used to move a lot of cocaine, you know, back in the eighties and stuff, but I wasn't aware that my homie was still moving cocaine for his father. Well, since I didn't go to school, I used to go to his house in the morning and I would always see his father go in the room and he'll do something in there and then he'll come out with a bag of I don't know what it was, I found out after, it was this bag of all cocaine. He had nothing but uh, keys in there, you know what I mean? And I didn't know the dad was doing it that big until we went in the attic and found his stash. 
You know, we went in the attic, we were looking around, we ended up opening up a suitcase, and there was so much coke in there. I, it, it looked like, I felt like I was in a movie, there was so much coke. I mean, it might have been like, there was like, I think I counted 16 bricks of coke, and they were all keys, you know, and my friend was gonna take one, and I told him, no, you take one, he'll notice, you know, that's too big of an issue, you know? So there was one to the side that was open, it had a little spoon on it, and um, I remember looking at it, and, and, and it looked real yellow, you know, and I didn't know what it was at that time, but what it was, it was Peruvian flake. It was coming from Florida, his dad was hooked up with a dude, and well, anyways, we took some of it. Boom, we took about, uh, I'd say about, maybe a, maybe a half ounce. We took, we had in the big sandwich baggie, and then we went to my older homies, and of course we had to pay him, but we told him, hey, can you quarter these up? Because back then they used to sell you a bindle. It was shaped like an envelope, and it was $25, you know? No matter what, 25, not 23, not 22, $25, and you get a quarter of Coke. Now, the Coke I had was really, really good, so by this time, you know what I mean? This, this, a year had passed, and we were doing different things with weed, but then we got into the Coke scene, and I noticed that the Coke scene, you know, there was a lot of people from Mexico that liked the cocaine. You know, they used to call it Perico. I used to see them and, you know, these dudes used to have little vials with little spoons on it, you know, and all of them had a long ass pinky ring. I mean, a pinky, uh, a nail, you know, your nails like that long. I used to wonder why they had long, long, long nails until they broke a bottle out one time and all of them were using their pinky nails to sniff coke, you know what I mean? And I thought that that kind of, you know, represent them, you know, because all of them had a long pinky nail in. I used to go to them and I used to sell to them in their bar and you know, these dudes always had money, man. They, they never came short, you know what I mean? They always had the money. You know, the only thing that, that, that irritated me was every time I took them coke, they wanted me to bring them a woman. Now, I wasn't into pimping and bringing women and all that stuff, but they bugged me so much that I had two homegirls and my homegirls were game for anything. They wanted to make money, so I took them over there. I got into the coke scene. And when I got into the coke scene, I was already getting into the gangs. So when I was in the gangs and I was in the coke scene, I was dealing coke. The next thing I know, I'm sitting in a two bedroom house, you know what I mean? Got big backyard, big front yard, and I'm having a barbecue there. And I remember, you know, my uncle tells his friend, you know, uh, they asked whose house it was and he told him it was mine. And it made me feel good, you know, being, I was about maybe 15 by this time and I was moving a lot of coke. I mean, I was moving so much where, my homie used to come by every night and drop me off an ounce of coke, you know, and I used to make bendo after bendo after bendo till my, actually my hands hurt, you know what I mean? And then I started noticing that for me touching the coke, you know, for you ones that don't know, you know, that stuff soaks in your pores. You know, it's like the fentanyl today, you know, you get it and you break it. And then once you put it down, it's stuck all on your fingers, you know? There's no way you can scrape it off with a knife, uh, Dust it off with your hands. No, there's no way it stays on your fingers. The only way you get it off that I've noticed is you rub it into your pores. And from me dealing at Coke way back then, I used to always feel, you know, awake, you know, not really alive, but awake, you know, and I smoked cigarette after cigarette. And I wasn't touching the Coke. What I was doing was I was selling it, but I had my little homie dealing with me and he was a big Coke head, you know what I mean? He used to bring me story after story. With, with, with the drug addiction and, and people doing drugs, I noticed that they will tell you anything, anything you want to hear. They'll give you the shirt off their back, they'll promise you a check next week, you know what I mean? And it just goes on and on and on. That's why they never say never front anybody. But the thing about it is, is that, you know, for an individual like myself that uses drugs, you know, um, when, I would be, uh, when I would be sick from heroin, I would do a lot of things I wouldn't do in my normal frame of mind, you know, rob somebody, steal something, you know, I wouldn't do that in my right frame of mind, but being strung out, you know, uh, there was things I would do that I wouldn't do necessarily today. You know what I mean? There was games I would run on people just to get their money, you know, just so I would have my wake up, you know, and it was always worrying about the wake up because, you know, that's like the only drug I could remember that from the addiction came a sickness you know, like I said, I went through the coke, I didn't get sick, went through the PCP, didn't get sick, the weed, used to get paranoid, but never sick. But the heroin, you know, when I first heard about it, I was like, I was 15 and my homie tells me, hey, you want to slam? And I'm like, I'm only 15 years old and I'm like, do I want to slam? Wow, you know, my father's been slamming all his life, I've been watching it all this time, all my uncles slam. 
You know, in my head, I actually thought that that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to slam heroin, go to prison, run around with my homies, and end up either getting killed when I'm dead, killed when I'm young, or live till I'm an old man and stay with the gangster mentality, the cholo mentality, you know, whatever anybody calls it, the thug mentality, stay with that all my life. You know, and at that age, when I was 15, my homie tells me if I wanted to slam some heroin. And I was like, yeah, he said, well, give me some of that coke. And I'm like, what are you gonna do with the coke? He goes, I'm gonna put the coke with the heroin. So he wants to slam a speedball. Now, I've never ever did it before. And I'm kind of nervous because, man, he's putting a lot of coke inside that heroin. And he draws up and he tells me, all right, let me see your arm, you know? And I remember exactly what happened. You know, I, I got a belt tied it around my arm and he injected me. I took off the belt. And I remember I got this, this, this rush, this, I mean, this rush that he feels like it rushes so fast that it feels like somebody grabs your top of your head and just rips your skull back. You know, it just feels like that. I, it, you know, I don't know what the name of it, but it's so much of a rush that it feels like they grab you and just peel you back. You know, and every hair on your neck stands up and then stuff that you hear, like you turn the water faucet on, it sounds like there's a waterfall. Everything's just totally loud. Like the water, you know, it's just totally loud in your ears. And then about five minutes through, all of a sudden you feel a warmness come on. It's like getting, it's like being in the cold and then getting a big old blanket and putting it around you. That's the best example I can give you of heroin. You, you, you like getting a blanket, you're in the cold and you get a blanket and you put it around you. You know, that feeling of, oh, that's how heroin feels. Like to me, it feels like you get a blanket and you just wrap yourself with it. It feels like you're encased, you're warm, you know, and then every pain in your body is gone. Every aching pain is gone. I know a guy who was in the hospital that shattered both his legs. He was screaming at the top of his lungs. When I got at him and I told him I had something that would make him stop screaming, believe me, he stopped screaming. But the only thing, he picked up a habit too, you know, something that, you know, I wouldn't advise anybody to pick up, but he picked up a heroin, ha heroin habit. And he went to Afghanistan, war and all that. He was one of my friends. He had episodes and all that. But when he was with me and he was on heroin, he never had an episode. But his legs were shattered. He had all kinds of problems because he wasn't on drugs. He did it on a sound mind. You know, I, don't give, I, don't, I think he got caught up in Afghanistan and he gets flashbacks and shit. But I noticed when he was with me, he never had a flashback. It's just like with my homie. When he used to get high with me, he never had problems. But when he got high alone, he had problems. This is the same one that me and him dealt coke together. Now, as we're dealing the coke, I tell you, I'm 15, I go to camp, I get back out. Lo and behold, I go visit my grandmother in Norwalk. I got two cousins from Norwalk right there. That's our grandma's house. I walk in the house about 12 in the afternoon. My aunt tells me, get all this shit out of here. I don't want this fucking shit in here. I don't know who brought this shit in here. I go in there, gang of PCP everywhere. Of course, I grab my issue, go to the hood, start selling it. The guy who it belonged to, now he's looking for me and my homie. He wants to know where in the hell we're at because we took a good amount of his juice. I say about. $5,000 worth of his juice, you know what I mean? And that's a lot of money back then, you know? It was like about 90 we took it, 89.90. Mind you, it was back then, and we took it. We took a whole duffel bag full. And we had it bumper to bumper. We had foods all juiced out on the curb, you know what I mean? Foods would stay there all night inside their car, you know what I mean? So we had to change that, you know? The hood started getting hot, you know what I mean? Food started calling us to the car to pick and then shoot at us, you know? So we are being careful, you know? Because we're selling juice right there, but we got to watch the guys that call us to the car because that was one of the tricks back then, you know, call you to the car and then shoot you dead, you know? So even though we got the juice, you know, we ain't smoking it, but everybody else is high as hell. We graduated from juice. They brought us some angel dust. Now, when I seen the angel dust, it was a square tinfoil and it was so small. And I was like, man, what is this? It's $10 of angel dust. So I go and I open it up. What do you do? You roll it like a joint. So I rolled it like a joint. Now, angel dust is a feeling of total invincibility. Like, no one can fuck with you at all. I'm talking about you become just that guy. If you think you know karate, you can perform karate, kung fu, whatever. I know I've experienced with it where I smoked a duster. I thought I was a karate guy and whipped this dude's ass with a gang of kicks and shit. But it was just the drug that induced my mind thinking that I was actual a kung fu fighter. You know, no karate, I mean, it's, it's a feeling where the dust is the same thing. It warms you up, you get a rush, but you just feel invincible, you know what I mean? And you don't want anybody telling you shit, nothing. And it's called angel dust. But they changed the name 
to Kukui dust because of the fact that the dust that my homie was making was black and original dust is green or brown. My homie had black dust, so they called it Kukui dust. And this dust right here, I say one joint, four people would sit down and wouldn't just stand back up. You know what I mean? And I like the dust, so I wanted to actually make the dust myself. So I said, you know what? Fuck this, I'm paying this dude to make it, this dude to fucking hold it. I'm eliminate all that shit, I'ma make it, I'ma hold it, I'ma sell it, I'ma collect all the money. So that's what I did, I got it, my brother and I told him, look, I want you to teach me how to cook dust, how to make it. He said, oh man, you don't wanna do it. I said, yes I do, man, I wanna make dust. So he went, got a big pickle jar, emptied all the pickles out, cleaned it real good. He went, we went to Compton, we bought a, a, a $300 pour, we went to the market and we bought mint leaves. You know, they come in a little can, you know, we bought about four cans of mint leaves. We got home, he got the, he got the big old jug, he threw mint leaves in there, he threw like half the juice in there, and he shook the bottle around, you know, and all the leaves were getting wet and they got all stuck to the sides. And he got it and he opened the, the freezer, boom, we stuck it in the freezer, boom, closed it about an hour or two later, we take it out, take a little bit out, roll it, let it dry, roll it smoke it and we were smoking it to see how potent we could get it you know but we we're we we're our own test dummies you know but the way we did it was i would smoke once then he would smoke the next one because if we smoked and smoked and smoked we wouldn't even know how good it was the stuff by the time we get it and take it out so we did it like that the first batch we made i remember the first batch we made we made 300 dollars each and that's selling just dimes you know and that's fresh you know one thing about selling drugs you, when you get to a spot you have to make that spot yours you have to make it known that's that's you you know you can't let anybody else come in and just deal because of the fact that they're stepping on your toes you know there's sometimes where we used to rotate there's four of us there we're all selling drugs okay first customer second customer third customer fourth customer and that's how we used to do it we used to rotate it you know because there are places where there's enough traffic and enough money for seven motherfuckers to deal right there. But it's just that a lot of people are greedy, a lot of people are jealous. They don't feel that there's enough for everybody. They want it all for themselves. And I learned that with the drug trade where, you know, um, you can give a guy a whole pound of weed. The next day, you might ask him to let you borrow $20. And in the, game, in the drug game, nothing's free. No one rides for free. They may think they got you high and it was for free, but I guarantee you a week or two later, they'll be like, hey, you got that money? What money? I remember the other day when I got you high. Okay, you got me high. What is it that you sold this to me? But since it's a drug game and it's through and through, you know, you gotta pay the dude the money because you own for the drug, you know? But they don't necessarily tell you, hey, I'm, I'm charging you for what I'm getting you high on. I was a strong believer, and if I tell you I'm gonna get you high, I'm gonna get you high, you ain't gotta bring no money, just bring yourself. But there's dudes out there that get you high and then they wanna charge you after, and that's where a lot of jams come up behind the drug game. The drug game, a lot of dudes will sell you drugs, and then sell you drugs, and then sell you drugs, and then one day, they swear they gave you the package, but you know you never got it. But it's his word against yours now. He's the one with all the dope. He's the one that's been supplying for me to pay my rent. What am I supposed to do? What am I gonna tell him? I just end up got to agree with him, take it as a lot, and pay him again for what he never gave me. You know, and, and what could I do? I mean, I don't have it on camera. I don't have nothing down on writing. I take no pictures. I can't sue this guy for not giving me my dope. So that would be the, the second thing. And that would be getting yourself into bullshit like that. And I'll be the first one to say, doing drugs is a fucking hard ass job. People don't look at it like a job, but it's so fucking hard that first thing in the morning when you wake up, that's the first thing in your head. The second thing is, where are you going? How far are you gonna travel? Because me, I'll travel anywhere. If it's good though, I don't give a fuck, I'll go wherever. And you know, either you would have to go far or you would have to wait fucking hours and hours. And I didn't like to do that. I wanted it on hand. So I used to tell my homies, if we could get it all here on hand, then we won't have to want from anybody else. They'll start wanting from us. So I learned in the drug game, if you're gonna get there, sit there and deal drugs, you have to buy everybody out around you or either bring them in with you. Cause it's not gonna work, everybody uh, trying to get everybody's clientele. People get confused, you know? Dudes will start lowballing you. You know, you'll be selling something for 10 
And dude will come and say, I got it for seven. You know what I'm saying? Now he's lowballing you. You know, he's going and getting your money that you're supposed to get for this dude. But a dude would rather pay seven and keep a couple of bucks for a soda or something instead of giving me the whole 10. But there are guys like that. There are those kind of drug dealers that they go wherever and whenever and just slide right in and start selling their drug until they get caught. There's another motherfucker that puts dope out there, but he puts laxatives inside it. So when you do it, you sit on the shitter for like two days, shitting water, you know what I mean? But this dude only does it like every four months. He'll pull it back out and then he'll pull it back. I guess he just makes money and then he'll pull it back. And that fucking dope is so fucked up. You know, that's another thing you gotta, you gotta do when you're, when you're doing that job, being a drug dealer or getting high, is you gotta make sure the drugs are good. And you have to check the shelf life. A dude could sell you a pound right now, and you put it up in your closet, and two days later, the shit turned into plastic on you. So you have to go and know how much shelf life does it have, how long is it gonna last, how long do I have to get off this before this shit starts getting weak or starts getting bad. A lot of people don't look at that. They don't ask the question. They go, is it good? Yeah, it's good. Let me try it. Oh yeah, it's good as hell. What, how good is it gonna be in two or three days? That's the question you have to ask yourself. That's the one thing that I see a lot of so-called drug dealers do. They do not ask, how much shelf life does this have? That's one of the most key things in drug dealing is making sure you know how much shelf life this fucking shit got. Cause I seen this shit that was bomb ass shit top of the grade um, ice. The next day it was fucking hard like fucking rubber cement. In a bag, just from sitting on a shelf, it turned into hard ass plastic. But the night before, we were smoking bowl after bowl, doing line, homie was poking himself and the shit was bomb. So you have to remember, the shelf life, you know? A lot of people say they got good ass shit, but the shit doesn't stay long. It's like nowadays, you use heroin and to tell you the truth, it's a waste of time because there's no more heroin inside the heroin. There might be 30% in there, but that ain't shit. Everything else is fentanyl, sugar, and amphetamines, you know, pills. You know, they're, they're putting pills in there. They're putting fucking uh, uh, fentanyl in there. You know, they're putting coffee in there, chocolate. You know, they, they cut it with all kinds of experiment, with all kinds of shit. But the one who's getting fucked is the one buying it. See, I'm buying it, putting it in my veins. And that's the whole thing about the drug trade. A motherfucker could hand you a balloon. You don't even know what's in it, but you open it up and put it in a spoon, cook it up and slam it. You don't even know what's in the fucking spoon. But you already gave your money away, dude already gave it to you. And you're so, you're so fucked up in your, your, your addiction where you ain't even really worried about what's in there. I've had shit turn purple. And I still slammed it, and the shit turned purple. I put it in there, and in the rig, and it turned fucking purple. And I, fuck it, I went with it. You know, that, that's the type of mentality that I had ever since I was young. With the PCP that I started with, fuck it. Started selling coke, fuck it. You know what I mean? Started selling dust, fuck it. I always just say fuck it. You know what I mean? I'm gonna sell as much as I can. You know what I mean? But see, I was the type of drug dealer where I never used a scale. And I always felt that if I don't use a scale, I'm gonna give you what you're satisfied with and what I'm satisfied giving you. So now we both walk away happy. But you also walk away with knowing in the back of your head that if you go to him, he's gonna give you point for point. If you come to me, I'm gonna give you some what you're paying for and some. So guys are gonna come to me. Other guys get mad, but they don't wanna do that. They don't wanna fork up a little bit, you know, like make, a sm make like a small sacrifice in the beginning to get that large reward in the end. A lot of these guys don't look at it in the future. They only look at it right then and there. You know what I mean? And drugs come and drugs go. You got drugs, you're the dealer. You got motherfuckers running to the store getting you soda, getting you water. You got a bitch rubbing your feet, trying to braid your hair. I mean, they, they're doing everything because you got the biggest sack. But let a motherfucker walk in with more. That whole crowd will just shift right to him. Without even a second thought of, Oh, we left this guy, no conscience whatsoever. I notice now that the fentanyl does that. Me and myself, I don't fuck with fentanyl. I don't encourage anybody to, but you have to remember that fentanyl is uncontrollable. You know what I mean? Once you OD on it, it's very, very hard to bring you back. I know, I've brought individuals back. 
maybe six total on fentanyl. And I hit him with Narcan, it didn't do a fucking thing. Hit him again with a Narcan, not a fucking thing. After the third or fourth hit of Narcan, they start coming too. With heroin, one hit of Narcan, you're back and you jump up. Fentanyl, you slowly get up. Then once you get up, you wanna lay back down because you have to lay back down, they just gave you Narcan. Some guys think, oh, I slammed, fouled out, gave me Narcan, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go slam again. No, you could slam your whole fucking batch and you ain't gonna feel shit. Narcan, along with Suboxone, have what you call a blocker. They block off so your, uh, your, um, with heroin, your, you, you uh, induce your, uh, Mm, I can't get the word right now, but there's, there's some type of a thing in your brain that, endorphins. You release endorphins, and the only other way they say you can release that kind of endorphins is with total, total excitement. But like uncontrolled excitement, you can release endorphins and feel the same way you feel when you're on heroin. And I always heard heroin was the main thing. When I got into heroin, yeah, in the beginning, it was the main thing, you know. It, it used to be good to get high in heroin. It used to feel good, run around, feeling good. Once you get used to doing heroin and you get strung out, it's no longer about getting high anymore. It's about getting straight, getting well, you know? And some guys get well on a dime. Some guys take some a whole gram to get well. You know what I mean? I'm the type of individual, I'm just gonna do some, then a little more, then a little more, because you can always do more, but you can never take off. If you do too much, you're just fucked. So I always encourage people, hey, just do half, then do the other half, then the other half. Don't do the whole fucking thing, because you, once you put it in your vein, you can't take off no more. It's all there, you know what I mean? And I know, just recently I OD'd. And when I OD'd, I knew I was going to OD, so I told my ex-girlfriend, get the Narcan, and I, that's all I said. When I woke up, came to, I was already walking around, but... It's just that I knew that I was going to OD. And the reason I knew I was going to OD is because I actually felt like somebody grabbed the back of my head and was trying to push me forward to the ground. You know, and I was trying to push back up and they would push me to the ground. And they knew, fuck, I'm going to OD because I felt that before, but only to an extent. It never went and it just kept going. You know, that's when you know you're going to OD, when it just keeps going. You know, always with heroin, there's a certain limit because you already slammed it. You know that it's going to hit that. Boom. And you're like, okay, it's, I'm good. It's cool. But with fentanyl, there is no limit because there is no rush. And that's what I don't understand. People slam heroin because they want the rush. Uh, the other shit don't give you a rush. Fentanyl doesn't give you a rush. Heroin stays like three, four hours. Fentanyl stays for 15 minutes, 10 minutes at the most, then you gotta get high again. I hear the gentlemen that say, oh, well, I don't fucking roll with needles anymore. I don't poke my vein anymore. Yeah, you smoke on tinfoil. Yeah, but I don't poke my veins. And hey, that's cool, you know, because I know once you poke your veins for so long, they just start hiding, they start disappearing. I used to have them everywhere. You know, I was a hive's dream, but little by little as the years passed, they just all went away. You know, they all went away, and that happens with drug use. You know, you're gonna abuse your body, your teeth are gonna fall out, you're gonna get skinny, you're gonna get white hair, all that's gonna happen. And you know what's gonna happen, but yeah, you keep going, like me. I know what's coming, but I'm welcoming it, because I'll keep going for it, you know what I mean? And, you know, um, I've dealt drugs all my life. And I can see it and honestly say, the best time in my life was when I wasn't around drugs, when I didn't deal drugs. I had the most things and they were all mine and they were all bought and paid for. I had a brand new car, a nice home, and a nice family. Drugs took all that away in a matter of shit, weeks. It just came and just took everything I had. You know, I honestly sat there with everything and said, I'm not supposed to be sitting right here. I'm not supposed to be the guy that's successful that can sit in his living room and watch a screen TV and watch a game on it. No, I'm not supposed to be in this position. So I set myself up for failure from the beginning. 
I might have put a number there and a goal and I was going to reach it. But all along, I was fucking myself because it's a true fact. You don't get high on your own supply. And that's a fact. And they say it all the time. I know that that is a fact now. Because if I'm going to do something, I ain't going to fuck with it. Because right there, you make money. It's just like life. I said, the best time in my life is when I wasn't on drugs. When I wasn't around drugs, that was the best time in my life. You know, I, I had the most things. I had the best time. I felt the best. And I didn't do one drug. I didn't even take an aspirin, you know, but drugs called me back. One thing about drugs is they're always going to be there. They're never going to go away. They're always going to be there. And there's always going to be another dude to step up and sling it. They could bust one guy, another guy's going to come in his place. Bust these girls, more girls are going to come in their place. You know, and the drug's always going to be there. It's like, now I got myself, I'll finish up by this. Now I got myself a place by myself. I'm finally alone. And it's cold at night. Sometimes it rains. You know, I tell individuals out here on the streets to go home with me so they can go to sleep in my house where it's warm. They refuse to go in the rain. They only got a tent soaking wet and they don't want to go with me. And I was asking myself, why in the fuck would a motherfucker not want to go with me when I'm offering them a shower, a warm bed, something to eat, and let's kick it and get high, homie? And no, they'll stay on the streets. And I asked why, and I, I found the answer. They gave me the answer. The answer they gave me was they didn't want to miss anything. That was their answer. They didn't want to miss anything. They feel from going to my house and going kicking back that they're missing some money or, or, or some dope that's going to come and they're going to be able to get high on with so-and-so. You know, they're, they're playing the hope fiend role, not the dope fiend role. They're not going to get the dope and getting high. They're hoping that someone will come along and get them high. You know, that's a hope fiend, you know? But that's the drug thing. You know, I wanted to share a little bit today about it because I've been involved in a lot of it. And there's only two things that come out of drugs. You go to jail for a long ass time or you die. It, nothing else is going to come from that. You, there, there are guys that made it to the top and they're way up there. I bet you they don't sleep comfortable. I know they don't sleep comfortable. They probably owe a lot of money. You know, we don't see it, but it's probably in the background. But I just share it because, you know, I smoke weed today in front of anybody, wherever it's legal. I wish they would legalize a lot of drugs. That would eliminate a lot of bullshit. But due to the fact that Someone up top needs their money, drugs ain't going nowhere. They're always going to be here. You know, it's just up to you if you're going to make it a part of your life. I'm not saying to make it a part of your life or not to make it a part of your life. Somebody could be a functioning addict. They can get high every day and hold a job and hold a family and do it until they die. More power to them. I can't. Once I get high, it's about me. My family comes second. You know, drugs is first. Whether I'm slinging it or whether I'm doing it, they come first before everybody. And they've been like that. I'm going to sit here and lie and tell you that drugs don't come before my family. Yes, they do. Because they're the first ones I think about in the morning. They're the last thing I think about going to sleep. And that's what I think about all day long. I don't think about my family when I go to sleep or when I wake up. Through the day sometimes, but nah, they're second when it comes to drugs because that drug is the first thing I want in the morning. That's the first thing I want to see. That's the first thing I want to feel. And that's the first thing I want to glance back at when I walk out of my house. It's just... That's the way it is, and that's what drugs will do, you know? So again, you want to get involved in drugs? Hey, more power to you. I hope the best for you. I hope you're the best drug leader in the world. Hope you get everything you want. But remember, there's always that flip side of the coin. You can end up in jail for the rest of your life or kill the wrong person because of a dr bad drug deal. You know, there's dudes out there that'll kill you for an ounce of weed, man. You got to be real careful because some guys are really serious about their drugs and their money, you know? So... Be careful when you go out there and you start experimenting drugs. Remember, they're always going to be there. So you don't have to get involved right now. Wait till you got all your shit together and you're 50 years old and you got your own house and shit. And then get involved in drugs. Well, you have your own home and you're going to die in that home. Don't do it now. Now you, gotta st you still got to go get everything. I wish I would have did that. I wish I would have got everything first. And they just threw my hands up and said, fuck it, let's get high now for the rest of my life. Boom. It would have been all better like that. But I'm going back and forth, you know, I'm still in that fold. Well, I, I, I encourage anybody, I advise anybody, man, wait till you're like 45, 50 if you're going to get involved in drugs. 
And maybe then, by then you won't want to, but get your house and cars and everything before you do drugs because believe me, if you're gonna get house and cars, the drugs is gonna take that too. And if the drugs don't take it, the cops will take it. Somebody's gonna come along and take it. So that's my advice. You know, and that's what I got to talk about today, Mark. Cool. All right, John. Thank you very much. Hell yeah. yeah. I, I had two more, Mark. I was, I, I wanna, I'm writing them down right now because I want to get them in my head. You know about